Are you a man who's struggling to gain confidence as a leader? Do you lack clarity in how to find it? Well, this is the Mentor Forge podcast, and I'm your host, Cartwright Morris. And like many of us, I too have struggled to gain confidence in many areas of my life that I needed confidence to excel. So I went on a pursuit to gain confidence by taking more risk in my decision making and in my relationships. And it led not only to confidence in my life, but success. Each week, you'll hear men speak about the risks taken and the confidence gained in their business, relationships, and faith. And if you're looking for the same, you can go to mentorforge.com to find out more about what I do in my confidence gaining leadership program. Now for today's episode. All right, welcome in to another episode of the Mentor Forge podcast. I've got Dylan Hyde with me today. I'm excited to have Dylan in. Dylan, how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just hanging in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coming all the way from Wyoming. You might be my first uh, guy from Wyoming on the podcast, so I'm excited to have you. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> how's, how's the snow been? Uh, well, we just got a fresh snowpack last night. So, yeah. you know, uh, actually, I just heard a statistic yesterday that this is the most snow we've had since like 1944, I want to say. There you go. And, yeah. So we've uh, got a ton of snow. It's been crazy. <laughs> yeah. Are you a skier or snowboarder? No. I mean, I, I yeah. snowboard every now and then, but uh, yeah, I broke my collarbone snowboarding. And ever since then, I've been kind of like, meh, I think I'm yeah. just going to. Hang out in a nice warm house. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> well, speaking of that, I want to get to uh, the fall. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw on social media that you killed your first elk with a bow this fall. Is that yeah. right? Yep. So tell me about that experience. How, what was, uh, how, I mean, as for my listeners who are clueless about one, elk hunting, but two, bow hunting and getting close enough to kill one with a bow. Tell me about that experience and how long of a journey it was to get to that point. Yeah, of feeling yeah, up. No, that's great. So, um, so we'll back up here. We've got basically since I started hunting uh, when I was like 15, I drew a I drew a nice elk tag here in um, Wyoming, and uh, you know I didn't bow hunt at the time, but I never ended up filling that tag, and I hunted really hard with my dad. And my dad definitely didn't have the passion like I did for, for hunting. So he was kind of getting annoyed with going all the time, you know? <laughs> um, so really my, uh, like to give me a background here, my background kind of carried me, uh, just like through my own passion. So I really had to teach myself and do a lot of the things myself as far as how to learn and, and what to do, um, uh, by watching videos on YouTube and just going out there and just, you know, practice making perfect, you know, and then mm-hmm. there's still no, I wouldn't even say there's such thing as actually perfect in the hunting industry, just because yeah. you're, you're out there and constantly blowing stocks and just trying to learn from your mistakes and learn how to do it for next time, you know, um, we yeah, I really started bow hunting, like probably two years into that. Um, and I learned how much of a challenge it was, but how fun it was. So I actually had not killed an animal with my bow or an elk with my bow for a long time. Like it was, it, it was a long time coming, uh, this last year killing something. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, the previous year passed up an opportunity to shoot an elk with my bow and, you know, it ended up, um, it ended up not being a good thing that I did that because there, were, I thought that maybe, you know, I was holding out for something better and, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm killing just a small raghorn in, uh, rifle season. So this last year I drew this tag and my main goal was to kill a bull with my bow. That was kind of like my main goal. And obviously I would have held out for something good too, cause it was a different tag that I had drawn. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was, it was one of those areas that I was in the elk every single time I had a bow in my hand. So it just, you know, like what a bow hunter would dream of, I was literally like in the elk all the time. Mm. There wasn't a day that I was not uh, chasing an elk. So that was the coolest part was I was actually, um, I was actually able to like, you know, practice stocks. Now I will say it's really hard still getting that close to an elk especially because the the elk that I had found was like a 370 inch bull elk. And I was trying to, trying to get close to him, but he had about 60 cows. So Mm -hmm. in bow season, um, you know, when a bull has all those cows, uh, they're, 
as many eyes. So it's really hard to get that close because something's going to see you and they're all going to take off, you know? So long story short there, it didn't work out. And I tried a new spot, just kind of up and out of the random and found myself down the bottom of this mountain and there were elk all over. And uh-huh. that's how I was actually able to, to shoot my first, my, sh- my first bull elk. Um, and you know, it was, it was a long shot, but, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that I took it because, you know, he died in probably, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. And it was a quick, quick kill. And uh, I would say it's the most ethical that an animal could have, you know, um, and just one of those things that, uh, that was pretty much where the work started. Um, <laughs> you know, and nothing seemed to go my way. You know, I, I came up to the elk and started cutting them up and looked at my backpack in my water bladder had broke and I had no other water. So I was four and a half miles from the truck. So it kind of freaked me out. I was like, Oh my gosh, I got to get back to the truck. I need water. Yeah. And it was, you know, it's September. So, uh, yeah, I had to make it all the way back to the truck. You know, at some points I feel like I was going to pass out. So I'm like sending messages when I got to service, like, yeah. Hey, everybody, if you don't hear from me, here's where I'm at. I'm really lightheaded and dizzy. I don't have any water in my system. Yeah. And people were like, oh, just take it slow. You know, made yeah. it all the way back to the truck. And then this thunderstorm just comes out of nowhere. Oh, and, uh, you know, just rain and thunder and lightning mm-hmm. striking trees. And it was crazy. I'm like, I got to get off this mountain. So I dove off the mountain so I didn't get struck by lightning. And in the middle of that rainstorm, I slammed into a rock, tore my running board off of my truck, and then get all the way down to the bottom. And we were in this HMA area. So what that is, is a hunter management area. So mm-hmm. landowners will give permission to the public to drive through their land. So I got down to the bottom and the landowner had locked the gate through that road because of the, the rain. So I had to drive all the way around, which took like two hours through just this horrible road while it's raining. And yeah, it's just, it was one thing after another, after another. And then basically I just waited through the night next morning, grabbed a few buddies, run up there and uh, we got, got them packed out. That one wasn't near as bad, but it seems yeah. like just one thing after another when that, when that kind of stuff happens, but yeah, wild story for yeah. sure. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I think that's what most people forget. Like, that's the just killing the animal itself is only the beginning, especially a big game like that. Dang. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm curious. Did you call in the elk yourself? Uh, No, I didn't actually. There was so many, uh, there's so much rut activity on there. It was easy for me to just kind of slip in where they didn't know I was there. Gotcha. And, you know, I, there's so many things I could take back and like shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know, mm-hmm. um, because I killed probably like, he was a good bull. He's probably like 310, 315. And there was like, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 bulls down there. And wow, he was probably like the 20th biggest one. Mm-hmm. So there was like probably 19 or so or 20 more that were just bigger than he was. Right. So um and the one yeah sure there's a couple in there i i swear i was like oh my gosh this thing is huge you know yeah. <laughs> um but yeah they were just all fighting each other and i mean when they're fighting each other it's kind of easy to get close you know right um but yeah i shoot him start walking up to him the biggest one in the whole herd starts walking up to me gets like 60 yards away from me yeah. and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. but yeah it was pretty cool what, what do you what is your self talk in the middle of those moments where you're like, I got to take advantage of this opportunity? How do you make sure you stay focused and engage and, and all that? Yeah. Um, well, my biggest thing is like in my mind, I just keep telling myself because it's real easy to get excited and just rush things. So mm-hmm. I just have to keep telling myself, like, just take it slow, take it slow, one inch at a time, one inch at a time, one inch at a time, you know, just slowly, slowly inch your way up, you know. Um, and that's like really important because, you know, if you just get too carried away, you just start running in there mm-hmm. and then you're just going to blow everything out of there, you know? So, yeah. yeah, that's pretty much my biggest thing I'm going through in my mind. <laughs> yeah. And does the, the repetition gun hunting elk, mm-hmm. 
does that is that help does that give you more experience to understand to to make you prepare for that moment with the bow yeah i would say so um you know it's with gun hunting it's a little different just because i mean you can be a little further away so you're practicing at that point like at a distance of 200 yards or 300 yards so right. you're kind of putting yourself in the element of that far away but mm-hmm. whereas bow hunting you got to slip within like i don't know 70 80 yards mm-hmm. so it almost brings a whole new like set of um uh like i, w- I wouldn't say rules but um just the way that it is <laughs> yeah. just because it's, you know, a little different because you're getting closer to the animal. Um, there's a lot more room for error. Um, especially with a bow. I mean, you got a dang bow and string and you're shooting an arrow, you know, mm-hmm. you're not, you're shooting it at 300 feet per second. You're not shooting at 3000 feet per second, you know? Mm. Um, so it's, it's definitely a little different, you know, um, yeah. just a few more things have to run through your mind when you're that close. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's fun. That's crazy. Just, uh, I mean, learning to be in the moment and enjoy that, appreciate it. I mean, how much of that mindset of hunting, especially in that experience, how much is that is that translated to any other part of your life? Today's episode is brought to you by Thrive Marriage Lab. If you want your marriage to thrive, this is a great opportunity to you. The strong marriages are the bedrock of strong churches, organization, families, and community. This is a 12-month pathway for any of you that are looking to really have weekly engagement with experienced marriage counselors. Not just one, but many. So go to restory.life backslash thrive to get on the waiting list for this great program that starts in April. That's restory.life backslash thrive. And make sure you put the word forge in the promo code to receive a discount on your monthly fee. Now back to the episode. You know, I would say like the only thing I would take a little more seriously is my faith in Jesus hundred percent, you know, just mainly because it doesn't matter the size of the bull you end up killing at the end of the day. You know, my mindset is we're really only living on this world for 80 years. So um, it's pretty important for my faith to be established and, and especially in who I am. Um, I will say like, you know, it's, it's fun to take my faith with me wherever I go, especially hunting, because, mm. you know, if you like get away, it's a great time to kind of sit back and reflect and just kind of be there in, in God's like country, you know, yeah. it's cool. You can just kind of take it in, especially if you're not finding an elk, you know, you can kind mm-hmm. of just still sit there and just take in his creation a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, man. That's uh, definitely, you know, something that's just, you know, very heavy on my heart, especially. Um, but, yeah, I would say uh, that's definitely something there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say, yeah, definitely times I felt closest to God has been in the woods somewhere. 100%. Right? Um, it would be like a saying, I feel like. Yeah. Like, or like a, a hoodie. So there you go. Somebody listening, put it on a hoodie for us. <laughs> <laughs> what's the saying i might do it myself <laughs> yeah yeah there you go if we could do the, the saying of like uh let's see um the closest to god i felt is in the woods or something like that yeah there that's a good closest to, yeah that's a good one i mean i have to do that man that's great <laughs> that's awesome so um i do yeah i'm, I'm kind of you kind of hit it a little bit but so i really am curious because of hunting especially the degree you're doing it, it's so much part of your life so right. why do why do you do it why do you take so much effort and time and have something where you're driving two hours out of the way to make sure you get back and <laughs> cut up that deer yeah. and put it in your freezer <laughs> yeah it's a good question i don't know man <laughs> no really uh, really i i don't know i just i really enjoy it like it's just such a fun experience you know um, every single trip is different, you know, in that aspect, it's not a rep- repetition and mm-hmm. you might be chasing the same animal, but that animal has different patterns than the previous animal. So you get to study that animal. It, um, you know, I don't know. It's definitely like, it's definitely a hobby, but you know, at the same time, it's, it's, it's just so fun and rewarding, especially when you do kill something. It's just, I don't know. It's, there's not really a way of putting it. It just kind of mm-hmm. have to kind of have to go out there and, and do it just to kind of understand how, um, how cool it is, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, 
That's a really good point. So I'm going to bring this up too. Like mm-hmm. in hunting, there's there's two types of people, it seems like, in the hunting industry. The people that are trying to make it as a career and the people that realize it's not a career and they're doing something else. So that way they can supplement the time off to go and actually, you know, mm-hmm. pursue money just to, as they're, you know, for fun. Right. And um, being on social media, I pursued it, trying to be in the hunting industry for a long time. Like I, I felt like that was something that, you know, like I love hunting so much. Maybe I can try and make something as far as a career out of it. Yeah. Well, the problem is you're pursuing like sponsorships and, you know, uh, like social media paying you. So like YouTube or like Instagram and in the grand scheme of things, like, especially in the hunting industry, you'd basically would, wouldn't make very much. So what I come to found, come to find out is pursuing that and putting the kind of time that I'm going to put in. I could have been putting it into something else and having a much higher uh, reward as far as the amount of money that I'm making and yeah. also picking the time off that I wanted. So that's, yeah. that's why I'm a realtor. <laughs> I'm, I'm my own boss. I can choose the hours that I'm working and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I make the, the money that I make and then I have plenty of time that I can just kind of go and, and enjoy mm-hmm. myself instead of forcing myself to have to film my hunt and, like, you know, there's a kill shot. I got to get on camera and, you know, I got to make sure that I'm keeping in touch with my sponsors every single month. I'm staying on top, top of social media all the time because I have to, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's kind of all that's there that my time is better spent, like where the money is and it's not in the hunting is- industry, long story right. short. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Huh. But that is interesting. You value something that is part of your life, not necessarily to make money, but you like I hunting has to be part of your life. So I will do things around it to support it. Yeah. Like a realtor job where there is flexibility. and Yeah. But it's uh, most important, too, because like I obviously have a family. So my wife and I have a little kiddo. So um, m- most importantly, obviously, I want to provide for them, you know, and that was kind of another decision is. You know, if I was going to be in the hunting industry and making that into a career, um, Mm. I don't think I would have supported them to the best of my ability. And though it would have been fun for me, I would have had probably a higher stress level at home. And I know plenty of people that are in this business that are doing that and they're doing that to their wife and their kids. Mm. And I just don't think it's right because I know the, the capability of a human being they are and what they could be doing. Um, but they just choose to do that just because of their own, like, personal gain, I would say. And, you know, at the end of the day, I wish real estate was a hunting career. I really do, but there's Mm -hmm. just no money in the hunting industry. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to force my wife to have to go through that lifestyle with me, you know, right? when it could be providing her much more income and, Mm -hmm. you know, more enjoyable life. And especially because of the freedom that, you know, real estate brings me, um, to, you know, that way we can actually enjoy our hobbies when we want um, we're not forced into anything, you know? So mm-hmm. it's, I think it's pretty key in separating those two, uh, right. especially, you know, having a family and making sure they're supported. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention that. I mean, you, you know, your wife, you know, your Instagram handle and YouTube page is fish hunt W Y O. Yep. And, and, and your wife has one as well. She's a, she has, you know, she has her hunts on there. Is that something y'all connected on early? Is that in your relationship yeah, well, with hunting? No, really. We, uh, I mean, we did connect on it, but um, we actually had, there's a picture on our fridge. We're three years old, holding hands. We were in this uh, Bible like class, you know, mm. um, when we were little kiddos. So we've gone to church together for a long time. Um, and we knew, knew each other, knew of each other more or less, you know, and then in high school, we kind of, um, we met through track. So of all things, you know, track is where we had met mm-hmm. and she was like wicked fast. Oh my gosh. Just yeah. the craziest. She's, she's literally the fastest chick in all of Wyoming. And she, I always tell her, she like left her track career to pursue me which was pretty cool um, because she could have definitely gone to college anywhere. Mm. Um, it was pretty cool. Me and Grace actually both had an offer to go at full ride scholarships over to UCLA for track and field. Oh, wow. And we both said no, cause we didn't want to go live in California and stay here <laughs> with our family. <laughs> so, yeah. We, we both good said Wyoming no. boy right there. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> that's definitely true. 
Oh, um, man. But no, we stayed, and that's kind of where we met. But, uh, you know, she had always expressed interest in actually going hunting with me, you know. And that's kind of the time I was really starting to get into bow hunting a little bit for the, you know, first couple of years. Um, so she's pretty much seen, you know, the, the beginning stages of me in bow hunting. And really, the, the really beginning stages of hunting as well for me. Because, you know, it was only mm-hmm. the first few years I really was starting to take hunting pretty seriously, you know, as far as my, yeah. my real, real like enjoyment, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, she, uh, she stepped in and said, yeah, let's go. And we like to do a lot of shed hunting too. So it's when the animals drop their horns every year, horns, sorry, antlers every year. Some people criticize me for that. Um, but yeah, so we like to do that too. So, I mean, we, it keeps us active in outdoors all the time, you know, but no, mm-hmm. she's, she's enjoyed it. Uh, her family's from back east, so um, you know that's mm-hmm. it's totally new for them over here anyway. Um, so yeah, she'd never been before. Starting to take her out, and then she just loved it. So she yeah. goes with me way back, and she Man. kills bigger animals than I do too. That's great. <laughs> That's serious. I'm dead serious. She does. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> it's that speed, man. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is the speed. Holy moly. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a YouTube video that's just like describe her speed. There's a it's her antelope hunt from like three or four years ago. Yeah. There's like a brief section in there where she's just running down this canyon. And I mean it looks fast, but in person, like I couldn't even keep up with her. I was literally wow. like out with the camera trying to keep up with her, but yeah, it's pretty funny. So if you ever had a chance, you should watch that. It's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> um, so I, I know you have kids as well. One kid too? Yeah, just one. Just one. I mean, with hunting um, and now, and being a dad and I'm sure, you know, uh, possibly having more kids. Right. How much of hunting do you feel like is an important part of in raising your kids and having that part of your relationship with them? You know, it's really um, just kind of right now, like my main focus is just kind of trying to give them as much exposure as possible. So like my little kiddo, her name's Everly. She's almost two years old and she can do the perfect bugle. But it's just because she knows that uh, like what an elk sounds like, you know. So you start pointing out like, what's a lion say? She'll go, rah you know yeah. and then an elk is also incorporated into that you know so she knows to, to just randomly just scream you know so um, <laughs> that's not an easy it. sound to make either no, no i feel like kids can rock it though for sure but yeah, yeah um no just incorporating it all into there and we just took her so we just got back from the hunt expo in salt lake and uh we walked her around and oh my gosh, she just loved seeing the animals, just all the taxidermy mm-hmm. animals and stuff, you know? So I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think her having the upbringing and like being exposed to that kind of stuff is going to be, you know, really good for her, mm-hmm. especially she's going to know probably a lot more about a lot of animals than most kiddos do, you know? Right. Um, but it's probably also important, you know, she's not to the stage yet where she understands where her food comes from, but you know, she'll get to that point where she's understanding that, you know, we hunt, we bring the the meat home and, and we eat it, you know. So um, instead of just going to the grocery store and just picking up something that you didn't kill, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's the blood's on my hands because I'm killing that animal, you know. Um, that's kind of that's kind of the cool part about it. You're almost grocery shopping, but for a live animal, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and there's yeah. probably not too much better you can eat than a, the red meat from an elk. So Yeah, yeah <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is interesting. I mean, I, I I have a friend of mine who says, you know, if if you're a meat eater, you're just choosing who does your killing for you. So, yeah. um, and you mentioned that earlier, just about the ethics of 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 killing an animal and dying within seconds. Because mm-hmm. um, I think most people do miss that. That you know, if they get killed by a pack of wolves, that takes hours. That's painful. Oh, yeah. You know, mauled by a bear, like. Yeah. Um, how much? Yeah, yeah. How much of that is that you put that into thought? And in, I don't know how much you hear of critics of hunting, yeah. but just no. It's yeah. it's yeah, a fair ahead. question for sure because you know, um, like like I was saying with my elk earlier, you know, I killed him and he died in like I don't know twenty thirty seconds. You know, um, I would say too the best part about that is they probably don't even realize they're dying because they just got blood just emptying out and they have no idea. You know. Um, I'm just going to say this because a lot of hunters probably don't say this. 
I don't think animals have the pain tolerance that a human does. I've seen some pretty crazy stuff with animals and they just mm-hmm. like, it just like doesn't phase them. Right. So I will say like, I've seen, you know, hunters shoot and, and shoot off like limbs of animals and they're just like, okay, yeah. I got two legs now. What heck, what the heck? You know, like mm-hmm. compared to like, if you got a, a limb shut off, you'd be like, Oh my gosh, I got three limbs, you know? Yeah. All right. <laughs> So I will say, like, just to kind of take a step back, they definitely don't have the pain tolerance that a human does. Absolutely. I've just seen it in, in the field. Now, I will say, though, like, you know, you kill something, especially I would say the most ethical, in my opinion, is with the rifle. Just because, you know, you're shooting 3,000 feet per second. You can dump two or three loads into them. They'll be dead in 10 seconds. Mm. You know, you might have to wait up to an hour for them to die. I've seen it. You know, so that's that's the truth about it. You know, sometimes it does take them longer to die. Um, and I don't think a lot of people will bring that up, but that's just just how it is. But still, I mean, you were kind of touching on it a little bit. You know, you got you got cold weather where they're like, for example, we got this crazy snow. Animals can't get around to eat food. So they're either going to die. One of three things there. They're going to die. Well, there's a lot of things. A predator can, could come eat them. Um Two, starving because they can't find food. Um, three, they could be, you know, too thirsty. You know, they can't yeah. find water. Everything's frozen. And four, they just straight up die from the cold, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, then it's the other way around in the summertime. They might get too hot. You know, they can't find shade. They die. Um, and it's not like they just up and die. It's a long and miserable death for them, you know. Mm. Um, they get wounded by trying to jump over a fence or... You know, they're just jumping from one creek bottom to the next and they broke their leg and mm. it slowly but surely gets an infection, you know, and it just takes a long time for them to die. You know, there's yeah. nature, like no matter how you look at it, is really cruel on the animals. So, mm. I mean, the, either way, you throw a hunter into the mix, I would, you know, I would definitely think that the hunter is the most ethical in that in that case for their for their death, especially because they're putting to use the meat. You know, that mm-hmm. meat is providing for that, that hunter's family, you know, um, and that's I think that's what's really important. And I think, you know, when you have these conversations between people who are not meat eaters and are just straight up like vegans, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of people will you know, some people will criticize you. It depends on the type of person, because some people just don't have a problem with it. They just don't want to eat meat themselves. And I understand the concept of being vegan 100% because they just sort of don't like the, the death of the animal. That's just kind of where they're at. Right. You know? mm-hmm. um, but I would say that I would at least hope that they have my respect because my I'm the one killing the animal. And I'm trying to do it as most, most ethically as possible. And that seems to be like the biggest problem with, with what vegans have with you know animals is they get killed in a, in a mm-hmm. like like they're like super thrown into this like tight pen and you know, they're just yeah basically living miserable animal lives. And then they just get mm. slaughtered and then shipped out. Then everybody just kind of randomly goes to the, to the store and buys their meat, you know? Um, in this case, I'm the one who's taking care of that animal's death. It's on my hands. Um, but it, I also get the meat from it. So I'm providing my own food, you know? Right. So I don't know. I would hope that I at least have mm. respect from, from them. You know, I don't have to have their, like, okay to do it, but at least yeah. they appreciate that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that, I mean, and that it, you're making the effort to go into their territory to, you're putting forth the fizzle exertion versus me just right. popping out of my car and walking in the grocery store. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Oh, what was the question I had? Uh, Dylan, I had a thought that I lost, but anyway, uh, <laughs> tends, that, right. tends, that, tends to happen. Um, but anyway, yeah, what do you, what's, uh, you know, before elk? Oh, this is what I was going to ask. Are you ever sick of eating elk? Have you gotten to that point yet? Uh, my wife seems to get there more than I do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like a guy is pretty simple. He could eat a, a bowl of cereal and you'd be all right, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get, a woman stepping into your life and you're making all these gourmet meals and you're just like, okay, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think I could eat elk like three times a week and be okay. Yeah. I yeah. think if I was doing it every day, I'd probably start getting old after a while, but mm-hmm. I, 
I mean, I pretty much eat at least once a week. It seems like so. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And so, <laughs> um, so you don't have the next elk season is not till the fall. Mm-hmm. What's uh, what's some of your outdoor activities you do before then? Yeah. So, uh, shed hunting is what we're about to get into. So we've got, uh, we're going to start watching elk. So what we do is we'll go and watch elk or deer and, uh, and elk will drop their horns in like basically April. So we will, uh, we'll go watch a big herd of elk that are all, you know, on public as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, We'll try and make sure that they're on public because if they're not, we're just going to have to go watch a different herd. But we'll pretty much bounce around and watch several different herds. And and then right when it kind of starts turning that April season, we start heading out there into the hills and we'll pick up their their elk sheds laying on the ground. So that's the biggest activity we have going. Um, we do this Jackson shed hunt, which is um, May 1st. And that one's pretty fun because, you know, it's just a giant race. There's all kinds of people that line up and yeah. we basically just head out into the hills and it's every man for himself picking up antlers, you know, and it's oh, pretty man. fun. But yeah, we all pretty much shed hunt through May. And then at that point, we start kind of finding out what I draw, but there's about a month period of time there. I don't have anything going. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'll probably just go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and are you a fly fisherman? Um, so I actually used to be a fly fishing guide for a little while, okay. um, but I no, I'm actually, I, 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 walleye fish. So I take my boat out to the, to the lake and I'll fish for walleye. Uh, yeah. Nice. Um, you spin a rod. What do you use? Open face. What's the, so, uh, yeah, spin and rod. We use like a little jig. So it'd be like this little plastic piece that you just mm. throw in the water and you just kind of jig. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's how you pick mm. up walleye. So yeah it's pretty fun they're really good eating <laughs> ah so how big do, i mean we got largemouth bass here how big do walleye get what's they're the, pretty similar to a bass i would say but you know they yeah. can get pretty big they can like a really big one would be like 30 inches so ah, uh yeah, yeah, that's pretty pretty big. Big. really so okay mm-hmm. um well dylan it's great to talk to you man well and i, I really love that you put at the top of your um, Instagram page is pursuing Jesus. That's number one. Number one. Uh, yeah, man. So I would just kind of to end on it. I would love just to hear, you know, why putting him number one, how that affects all areas of your life. You know, like it, it probably doesn't do anything, but give me strength and hope for everything and in every area of my life, really. Um, I don't know, like pursuing, pursuing Jesus, obviously, like I said, needs to be number one because, you know, it's easy to take, um, hunting and just can, and can be totally consumed by it, you know, anything really. I mean, it could be any kind of hobby you have or any kind of just enjoyment. Um, it's important to know that like, that's a gift to be able to enjoy that, especially from your creator, you know, yeah, it's constantly giving thanks to him to be able to, um, be given that opportunity to be able to do that. And, you know, I do realize there's a lot of people that just, they don't believe that that's a thing, but I mean, I truly do just because, you know, you're, you're ultimately not the one that said you can be born, you know, you're just kind of mm-hmm. here in the world, you know? Um, and a lot of people kind of have that thought process. And in, in my opinion, a hundred percent, like it's definitely God who gave you the the gift of life, you know? So yeah. to be, be appreciated of every, in every aspect of your life, you know, in the good times and the bad, like, you know, there's a quote from this movie called Facing the Giants. And it's a it's an amazing movie, but it's a football movie. And there's a there's a part in there where they, you know, they're praying before the game. They said, you know what, God? Um, if we, if we win this game, we're going to praise you. If we lose this game, we're going to praise you. And it's important to take that mindset into every aspect in your life because, um, you should be praising it no matter what, especially mm-hmm. giving you the opportunity to, to live, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's important for sure. <laughs> man, that's great. Well, Dylan, I appreciate you coming on, man. For, uh, my audience out there that want to find out more about you, where, where can they find you? You know, biggest platform I have is Instagram. I do a little bit of stuff on YouTube, but not a whole lot. Um, you know, maybe just a couple of videos a year. So it's kind of sad. <laughs> but, you know, I've always said, oh, I hope that I'll put more videos out there. But I don't know if I will. Great. If not, 
you know, whatever. <laughs> but Instagram, I'm on there all the time. So, um, okay. yeah, you can catch me on Instagram with Fish Hunt Wild is what it is. So Awesome. Well, Dylan, I appreciate you coming on, man. It was, uh, it was a blast talking to you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Mentor Forge podcast. It's been a blast having you. Love doing these interviews. But if you're like me and sometimes it's hard to find time to watch a full interview, I recommend following me at Mentor Forged on my Instagram page as well as subscribing to my YouTube page where I have just little sample size clips from my podcast and you could kind of watch 30 seconds to 60 seconds worth of a of an interview and find out if you want to listen to the whole thing. So yeah, check me out on YouTube as well as Instagram. And once again, thanks for listening.